Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Bauer from Colorado Canine Orthopedics and Rehab Center, and I'd like to talk a little bit today about canine elbow dysplasia. Canine el elbow dysplasia is kind of a cousin to hip dysplasia. It's a congenital, we think primarily a genetic problem, where the bones of the elbow joint just don't line up appropriately, resulting in rubbing and pressure and fragmentation. Uh, it's a disease of sporting and large breed dogs, golden retrievers, Labradors, Rottweilers would be very typical examples of the breeds that would be affected. Before we actually talk about the pathogenesis and how this disease occurs, uh, we need to re review a little bit of anatomy uh, about the elbow joint. And the elbow joint is really formed from three different bones. Uh, the bone above is the humerus from the shoulder joint down to the elbow joint. And then two bones below the elbow joint, the radius, which is the primary weight-bearing bone, and the ulna. One key point uh, to, to know so that we can communicate well in anatomical terms is the terminology of the inner side or the medial side of the joint and the outer side or the lateral side of the joint. So this is a plastic bones, uh, but it would resemble a left forelimb coming toward you. Uh, so this is the medial aspect, this is the lateral aspect. And then there are several key components of the three bones. And those key components, they have their own specific names. Uh, one is uh, the bottom portion of the humerus is the humeral condyle, key point. And the other key points are really on the bone specifically on the ulna. Uh, and those key anatomical areas are one, this little notch, which is the semilunar notch, and the bottom portion of that is the medial uh, coronoid process. And that is where a lot of the pathology occurs. At the top part of the semilunar notch is the ancineal process, uh, we're not going to talk about that much in this video. It's a disorder uh, that we see involving that process in German Shepherds, uh, but what we're focusing on today is, is the disease processes that, that occur on the uh, medial coronoid process. Uh, the other important aspect of it is the radial head. And so the radial head, uh, the weight-bearing portion, lines up with the semilunar notch and lines up with the medial coronoid process and we can see that on this illustration so here are the plastic bones semilunar notch coronoid process radial head uh, and again the humeral condyle and we see those labeled over here on the uh, radiograph or x-ray of this image and you'll notice that one of the key areas the medial uh, coronoid process is kind of hidden on a side view x-ray uh, from the radial head. But that gives us kind of a brief overview of anatomy so as we talk about uh, the clinical signs and the diagnosis and the treatment uh, all of those things will make more sense. So let's go from anatomy to the pathology and what really occurs in, uh, in dogs that have uh, elbow dysplasia. The primary problem is that weight is not distributed evenly within the joint. That certain areas of the joint receive extra pressure, extra loading, and extra rubbing. Uh, and so the, the, the primary area that receives that extra load and extra rubbing is the inner portion of the joint or the medial side of the joint. And the medial side of the joint, again, is where the coronoid process, the medial coronoid process resides. So when dogs have elbow dysplasia, they actually wind up with too much pressure on their medial coronoid. And this is an artist's illustration uh, that shows that. And so this is the coronoid process, the medial coronoid process. This is a medial or inner view of the joint. And so this illustration shows that there's excessive rubbing along the medial coronoid process and the uh, humeral condyle. Uh, and because of this extra loading and extra uh, forces and stress, we wind up with cartilage wear and tear, and we also can end up with fragmentation uh, off of the coronoid process. Another key component to this pathogenesis of this problem 
is when the radial head and that uh, semi-lunar notch and coronoid process fail to line up well. And the typical scenario is, is that the radial head sits too low with uh, ending with excessive force and pressure on the coronoid process. Uh, and the other thing that happens is the joint is not a static joint. I mean, these, this junction where the radius interdigitates with the coronoid, uh, it actually rotates. And that rotation also puts pressure and force on the medial coronoid process and also uh, leads to cartilage erosion uh, and damage and fissuring. So that's a little bit of an overview of, of what happens with the pathology involved with the canine elbow dysplasia. The primary clinical signs in dogs with elbow dysplasia is limping. Uh, and when dogs limp on their front limb, they do kind of this head bobbing. I have an example of that. Uh, and so this uh, sweet girl is limping along, bobbing her head as she walks. That's a, a really typical forelimb lameness. Um, and that lameness may be present all of the time. It may be present only after exercise. It may be present after exercise and then rest. Uh, so it's quite variable and somewhat dependent on, on the, the degree of the, of the problem. The diagnosis of elbow dysplasia is made with multiple modalities. Uh, a real critical one uh, is physical examination. And on physical examination, uh, we find that there's not full range of motion within the joint. We find the joint to be thickened on palpation. We find rubbing or crepitus as we move the joint back and forth. And of course, there's discomfort on extension and there's discomfort on tight flexion. So physical examination is a really important part of the diagnosis. Uh, we also rely heavily on radiographs or x-rays. And here we see an x-ray in the same orientation as we've been holding the bones. Uh, and you know, on this x-ray or radiograph, again, we see the humerus, the ulna, the radius. The area in question uh, is kind of hidden behind the radial head. That's the medial coronoid process. And seldom do we actually see on an x-ray that fragmented uh, or actually see it even look very abnormal. Uh, it, it's one of the downfalls of radiography that, that in this two-dimensional view, uh, it's somewhat hidden. What we do see on x-rays, and this is a early, these are early changes, what we do see uh, is increased density in the bone just below the cartilage. Uh, and that density is called sclerosis, and it's under the cartilage, so it's subchondral sclerosis. So we see this area is extra dense white. In this case, we're also seeing some early osteophyte formation. You can see a little bone spur or osteophyte forming on the ankyneal process. Even though the ankyneal process is not the problem, the joint is inflamed, and that's where the joint capsule attaches, and so the blood supply is good there, and so because of the chronic irritation from some level of rubbing and malformation on the medial side of the joint where the medial coronoid process meets the humeral condyle with this chronic inflammation that results in bone spur formation around the edges of the joint where the joint capsule attaches. So that's what we see in this relatively subtle uh, change on this x-ray. When the clinical signs become worse and the pathology becomes worse, we see worse and worse radiographic signs. And in this case, this is a, a really, really arthritic elbow. These are bone spurs or osteophytes that have formed off the head of the radius. A lot of osteophytes forming all around the top portion of the joint. Uh, severe subchondral sclerosis. Uh, and what we can't see on this radiograph is the cartilage. Uh, and that's one of the key points of, of, of what happens in the pathology of this is they wear away their cartilage. So the x-ray doesn't help us on that, but it shows us these changes and through experience we know with virtually 100% confidence when we see anywhere near this degree of radiographic changes, we're going to find full thickness cartilage erosions, and I'll get to that in just a moment. The other thing that we use a lot these days uh, for uh, working up and diagnosis of elbow dysplasia is a CT scanner. 
And so a CT scanner is a complicated x-ray machine. There's a tube within this donut that spins around at uh, very fast speeds and takes literally hundreds of radiographs of the patient from all different angles, feeds that into a computer program, which then can give us a three-dimensional image or an image that's similar to a loaf of bread that's been sliced. So on the loaf of bread analogy, if there were a piece of mold in the middle of the loaf of bread and we took an x-ray of that, uh, we wouldn't see that mold. But if we did a CT scan of it, then we could have slices of bread so that we could open up the loaf and look at that one specific spot, we'd be able to see it. And so that's what really helps us with, CT, with elbow dysplasia with a CT scan, is we can see these little bread slices. And in that case, we actually will see the fragment that we don't get to see on radiography. So CT scanning's been really valuable. The most valuable thing that we've, that we've used for diagnosing and in some cases treating elbow dysplasia is arthroscopy. Arthroscopy uh, is very non-invasive. Uh, we can do it through a small poke hole. They, they are typically under general anesthesia, but a small poke hole uh, into the joint to examine all the structures. And that allows us to evaluate the cartilage. It allows us to evaluate congruency of whether the radial head and the coronoid process are lined up. And it really is our best diagnostic tool uh, for making the diagnosis and prognosticating and developing a treatment plan for dogs with elbow dysplasia. There's various treatment options for canine elbow dysplasia depending on the degree of problem that we find through x-rays, CT scanning, but mainly the arthroscopic findings dictate what we do. Uh, in cases with fairly mild disease that may just have a single individual fragment like we see in this example, um, and the rest of the cartilage is in good shape, just fragment removal may be all that's required. We often will debride the edges, clean up the edges where we remove the fragment. When there's actual disease and cartilage damage to the coronoid process, then fragment removal alone is inadequate, and we actually remove a portion of the coronoid process, and that's called a subtotal coronoidectomy. And here we see an example of a dog that has a large fragment of coronoid, but then just below it, all the cartilage has been damaged. So this patient would be a candidate for a subtotal partial coronoidectomy. And that is done either with a small osteotome or chisel, and that's what this slide is depicting. Uh, we also have a motorized electric uh, burr that it looks like a dental burr, and we can remove it with that as well. So that's kind of one step up from fragment removal, uh, and it's commonly done, subtotal coronoidectomy. In some patients, though, we see really severe cartilage damage on both the bone above the joint and below the joint. And this is a little video that shows that. Um, and so here we see a lot of cartilage damage. The bone above is the medial uh, humeral condyle. Cartilage is eroded there. Cartilage is all eroded from the entire medial aspect of the joint. You see the radial head wiggling in the background there. But, and there's a fragment at the front of the joint. But in this patient, fragment removal alone, or even subtotal coronoidectomy, is probably inadequate to re really relieve the clinical signs. So there's an ongoing debate about what the best thing to do is in, with a patient that has this severe cartilage damage on the medial side of their joint. Certainly, one thing that's been around for a while and we've employed uh, is some form of a bone cut to try to change the area that is loaded. And one of the more common things done uh, is an actual bone cut that goes in an oblique, long, across form across the ulna just below the joint. Uh, and it's called a dynamic, biplanar, proximal uh, ulnar osteotomy. And it involves making a long cut through the bone. Again, it's a non-weight bearing bone, so we don't plate this or pin this after we've uh, performed the surgery. So a long oblique cut through the bone. And what that allows is it allows the bone to tip up uh, and it unloads what's left of the medial coronoid process and it unloads the, the humerus that sits above. 
So that's a fairly commonly performed procedure, uh, a dynamic proximal uh, biplanar ulnar osteotomy. There's another bone cut that's been employed for dogs with elbow dysplasia. We've done about 50 of these, and it actually involves uh, cutting the humerus. Uh, and it, it involves a transverse cut through the humerus, which is a weight-bearing bone. And then it is slid over uh, in a plate supplied, and it's called a sliding humeral osteotomy, or SHO. Uh, and we see on this diagram that uh, we've shifted the bottom of the portion of the bone over, and what that's allowed is a line of weight bearing from the shoulder through the bone and then ending in the lateral aspect of the elbow joint where the cartilage is healthy. Uh, there's recent evidence that it indeed is effective. Uh, it has a moderate complication rate. It's a relatively big surgery. There is some worry with any of the osteotomies, uh, including this one, that we may overload the radial head. So it, I would say it's not a real popular choice at this time, but it is an option depending on the degree of problem that we identify. A newer version of osteotomy developed in Europe is called a proximal abducting ulnar osteotomy. And uh, the gist of that is that a cut is made in the, the ulna uh, and then a specific bone plate is applied and that bone plate allows tipping uh, of the joint. And so uh, I have a couple pieces of styrofoam to illustrate that. So there's a bone cut is made in the ulna and then it is tipped. And so what that does is it opens or unloads that medial surface of the joint and it somewhat loads the lateral surface of the joint. And so that's uh, currently being done with, with uh, a fair amount of success for dogs with fairly severe elbow disease. Um, and then there is another surgery out that is called the canine unicart compartmental elbow arthroplasty. And that's a resurfacing technique. You could look at it almost like a partial joint replacement. But what it involves is a snowman shaped metal plug that's placed in the bone above in the in the uh, humerus and then a single circular plug about the size of a pencil eraser that is a, a high grade plastic and those two surfaces rub on one another so it takes away that medial rubbing bone on bone and so its uh, acronym is the Q uh, and that is, uh, that is certainly being done as well. So those are the main surgical procedures that are done. Elbow replacements are, uh, have a fairly high complication rate. Not many uh, universities or private practices are performing elbow replacements in dogs uh, in Europe or in this country. Um, the overall, the prognosis with this problem really is dependent on how bad of the, the, the joint is and how malaligned and how much cartilage damage there is. Uh, all of these surgeries offer some uh, good advances and improvement in treatment. Uh, we think most dogs that have elbow dysplasia that require surgery are probably not going to be completely normal, but we certainly feel like we alleviate pain and we minimize how bad their osteoarthritis is going to get in the long run. So. It's certainly a condition that is a challenge for veterinary surgeons. We've made a lot of advances uh, and, and we've helped a lot of dogs. So uh, if you'd like to learn more about that, uh, we have additional information on our website. So, all right, thank you very much.